Welcome to Author Stories, the podcast where we talk to the best writers in the industry and discuss writing and the creative process. Whether you're a writer, a reader, or both, we hope you'll find something here that makes you love books and the writers that create them. You can find archives of all of the great conversations I've had with authors over the years at hankgarner.com. Take some time and browse around there. I'm sure you'll find a new author to love, find inspiration for your own creative life, and find a new story to get lost in. Let's thank some sponsors who make the show possible. Vedic by K.J. Heritage The dead don't always die. Top company scientist Chin Jelinek has committed suicide. Vedic, a half-alive empath with no memory of who or what he is, will die in six hours if he can't find out why, or so the company tells him, an added incentive to get the job done. Our hero soon discovers he is one of the skilled, a genetically enhanced human revered and despised in equal measure, a bloodhound with a terrifying past who will stop at nothing in his pursuit of the truth. And the skilled always get their guy, don't they? Vedic, number one, by KJ Heritage, on sale now. There's a link to it in the show notes. KJ Heritage's uncanny sense of pacing and story puts him at the forefront of today's speculative fiction writers. Gritty, intense, and compelling, Vedic is something you don't run into often enough in sci-fi, a cerebral thrill ride you don't want to end. Prepare to lose sleep reading Vedic, delicious science fiction. That's what other people are saying about it. Find out for yourself. Vedic, the first book in the series by K.J. Heritage. Jasper T. Scott, his box set Dark Space, the complete series. This is six books bundled together on sale now for 99 cents. Six complete books, over 600,000 copies sold. More than 2,000 pages of epic space opera for the low price of 99 cents, also available in Kindle Unlimited if you're a Kindle Unlimited subscriber. Humanity is defeated. Ten years ago, the Scythians invaded the galaxy with one goal, to wipe out the human race. Now the survivors are hiding in the last human sector of the galaxy, dark space, once a place of exile for criminals, now the last refuge of mankind. The once galaxy-spanning Imperium of Star Systems is left guarding the gate which is the only way in or out of dark space, but not everyone is satisfied with their governance. Freelancer and ex-convict Ethan Ortain is on the run. He owes crime lord Alec Barandi 10,000 souls, and his ship is badly damaged. When Brandi catches up with him, he makes an offer Ethan can't refuse. Ethan must infiltrate and sabotage the Valiant, the Imperial Star System's fleet carrier which stands guarding the entrance of dark space, and then his debt will be cleared. While Ethan is still undecided about what he'll do, he realizes that the Imperium has been lying and putting all of Dark Space at risk. Now Brondi's plan is starting to look like a necessary evil, but before Ethan can act on it, he discovers that the real plan was much more sinister than what he was told, and he will be lucky to escape the Valiant alive. Grab all six books for 99 cents right now. Dark Space, the complete series by Jasper T. Scott. The Unwelcome Trilogy by R.D. Brady. Survivor, Mother, Leader, and Humanity's Last Chance. Deep within the remnants of the United States, Lila Richards oversees a camp of 200 survivors. In a world where living is an everyday struggle, and only through banding together can people survive, the arrival of the Unwelcome only made her job harder. Riley Quinn and Miles Jones have been raised by Lila for the last five years. They're also one of the cursed, the children between the ages of 13 and 18, whom the unwelcome kill on sight. No questions, no pleas, just death. Protecting one another and the people of their camp is ingrained in all of them. But now each of them faces increased danger as the reason why the cursed have been targeted by the unwelcome slowly comes to light. And that truth will shock them to their core. Now time is running out, not just for the cursed who are being hunted down by the unwelcome, not just for Lila and her family who will face the greatest challenge yet, but for all of humanity. The world changed radically 35 years ago, but today humanity's very existence is on the line, and the fight has begun that will ensure its future 
or its annihilation. Fans of A.G. Riddle, James Rollins, Suzanne Collins, and Brandon Sanderson will love the Unwelcome Trilogy. Pick up your copy of the Unwelcome Trilogy on Amazon today. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm super excited to have Marco Raffala on the show with me. He has a fantastic new book that uh, just came out a couple days ago. It's called How Fires End, and this is his uh, his debut novel, but uh, he's had quite uh, a career already in, in writing for other mediums. We're going to talk all about that good stuff. Welcome to the show, Marco. Thank you. Happy to be here. Marco, we begin each show with the same question, and that question is, what is your first memory of wanting to be a writer or storyteller? I think it goes all the way back to my father, actually. Um, he never read a book to me, but he was always telling me stories about Malili, Sicily, which is the village that he grew up in. Um, he was a young boy during the Second World War, and that experience made him into a, a hard man. But there were moments when that tough exterior cracked a little, and this other more tender person came through. And it was, in, it was when he told stories about Sicily or sang Italian folk songs while he was working around the house. I remember his favorite song um, was Cecilia Bebda Cecilia Mia, which translates into Beautiful Sicily, My Sicily. And that song tells the story of a, a Sicilian man who comes to the United States looking for work but longs to one day go home, to go back to Sicily. And it seems like that song was a perfect mirror for my father's own complicated relationship with where he came from. And the, the power that song held over him is what drew me to music at a young age. I wanted to be the song or to write the song that captured his heart, his emotional attention. But I never thought seriously about being a writer until I think until I was in college. And then when I did, it was those stories that my father told and the songs that he sang that drove me. So at, at a young age, you realized the, the connection uh, between music and, and storytelling and, and the power that that music could have to uh, uh, you know, bring out someone's uh, true personality or to to break through a harsh exterior um, that when did you was it the, the songs that your dad sang? And uh, because you said that you wanted to uh, to make that connection with him again. That's uh, that's pretty powerful. Yeah, I mean, you know, he he was um, a macho, tough guy you know he's a laborer he worked construction he worked in a factory um he didn't have time for books he didn't have time for art but but then he there were those moments where he he's home from work and he's he's just whistling or singing a song because he listened to the italian uh the local italian radio station on the um um let me back up the uh wesleyan university is in the town that i grew up in and uh, they had a, a local Italian program on their station, and he would always listen to it, and they would always play Italian music and folk songs, and he sang along to them. Um, and that was just when I, he became a different person when, when, um, when, those, when I saw those moments. And I, that was just – it was interesting to me, but I, I think more than that, it was um, the attention – Right, the emotional attention that that I was, I think that I was craving from him because he was a distant man because of the trauma that he experienced during the war and and afterward. You are a, a first generation American, aren't you? Yes. Um, w was your mother uh, an Italian immigrant as well? No, my father married an American uh, woman with a Irish and Swedish background. Nice. Did uh, I, I've. I've often wondered, um, you know, as 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 a a multi generational uh, American, um, you know, we we get this ingrained sense of of self and place, um, 
but then we're always looking backward to the places that we came from and and all of my family are Irish and Scottish and English and you know there's a certain connection that you feel to uh to sometimes these places that you've never been these people you've never met but there's there's a certain uh, it's it's a weird longing that you know pulls us back to where we come from that being so closely connected uh with your father uh to to Sicily and and hearing his stories uh, but then also having a, a mother who is uh, already an American, were you? Did you feel a pull between your heritage and uh, w- what is that feeling like uh, for a kid who's who's growing up American but has these close ties uh, with an immigrant father? Uh, it was uh, it was dif- it was difficult. Um, I remember, um, you know, being. Like I have an older brother, and uh, we used to watch Star Trek reruns together when we were kids. And I just gravitated toward the character of Spock because of that that um, duality that he that he lived in. He was half human and he was half Vulcan, right? And and I there was, I mean, my my mother she made sure that we had books in our lives. She took us to the library. She took us to bookstores. Um, my father didn't have time for that. He thought it was a waste of time. We should be outside working with him because that was his experience. Um, and we had a really big backyard and he turned most of it into a garden. Um, and every season he would buy manure to fertilize his garden. And my mother would close all the windows tight because of the smell and he would open all the windows because it's a nice day outside. So there would be this argument between the two of them. And our neighbors would not be happy with the smell of the manure that, you know, <laughs> drifted into their yard. So we were like, we were weird. And I knew we were weird. I knew that we weren't like everyone else in uh, in the neighborhood, especially when we went to public school. Because uh, at first we were in a uh, Roman Catholic school with all the other Sicilian American kids. Um, and then, you know, at one point my father decided, why am I spending all this money when there's a free school down the street? So, um, and that's when I really started to see the, the difference between his culture and where we were living, you know, and that's when I, that's when I experienced, um, music, uh, American, not, I guess not American music, uh, British new wave, punk rock, all of those kinds of, um, those, those musical, uh, elements that were prevalent in like the early, late seventies, early eighties. Um, you know, and, and got, a, got an earring and grew my hair out long. And then there were lots <laughs> of arguments, you know, between, between my father and I over those things. And yeah, so there was definitely, tension there oh man i remember those days uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know I have, a, I have a picture of my father and i at the exact same age 19 perhaps um 18 uh and and i look like or i'm trying to look like robert smith from the cure you know my hair is all teased out and i've got i'm wearing eyeliner and you know the whole the whole bit and he dressed up very nice with a you know his, his hair is Everything about him is perfect. He looks like a like a silent movie star or something, and that just tells you all you need to know about. He must have just looked at me like, "How can you be my son? Who are you right. from another planet?" Oh God, that's great. Um, you you mentioned feeling that connection to Spock uh, from Star Trek. Did did you were were you a big science fiction or fantasy fan? Um, my brother was a huge, and he still is a huge science fiction fan. Um, And, you know, he's my older brother. So when I was younger, whatever my older brother was into, I wanted to be into. It must have been it must have been cool. Right. So and and it was um, I mean, I raided his bookshelf. I read all of his Ray Bradbury books. I read whatever whatever was on his shelf. I read uh, and we did. We watched Star Trek together. We watched um, a lot of old 70s science fiction films together when we were kids. Um, But I also liked fantasy. Um, I loved all those um, Ray Hera, uh, I can't pronounce his last name now. Harry Housen? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, like the, the, um, Jason and the Argonauts and all of those, all of those old films with the stop motion animation. And, and I read the Lord of the Rings and all of those, all of those books. 
That's great. Um, you you have gone on to write um, uh, for several tabletop RPG games. Um, how did that uh, come into your life? That was by accident. Um, I w- and I you know I had played like Dungeons and Dragons and, and other role- tabletop role playing games when I was a kid in the eighties. Um, I was definitely you know one of those those kids in Stranger Things in the basement, you know, playing, playing, uh, D and D minus the real life monsters. Um, and, and then I got into music and, and, and put the, put games aside. And then at, at, at some point later in life, I rediscovered the joy of the, of, um, what is essentially to me, collaborative storytelling, a bunch of friends sitting around a table, um, telling a story and being character and being characters in that story. Um, and I was online on a, on a forum chatting with, uh, someone who ended up being a game designer, um, who offered me a job and that's, that's how it started. And that was my first, um, first freelance gig for the one ring, which is a tabletop role-playing game based on the the Lord of the Rings, the Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings. And then from there, it's just more, you know, I got more work. I started knowing other people in that, in that industry and started doing work for uh, another company that um, has the license for Star Trek. And, and then they put out a, a Star Trek tabletop game. That's, uh, I, I think that would be a dream come true for a lot of, uh, uh, you know, people that, that grew up, being fans of the cooperative storytelling. Um, and I, I think that's one of the most mis, um, misunderstood aspects of, of most RPG games is it's, it's not a group of people battling each other. It's, it's a cooperative effort. And the ultimate goal is to go on this adventure together and to tell the story. Um, how do you feel like playing those kinds of games has uh, affected? Well, I mean, it, there's an, there's an obvious path from there to you writing for those kinds of games, but, you know, even past that to the new book, um, do, do you feel like your time playing RPGs and then going on to write them has affected the way that you see story and the way that, that, uh, that you've learned to connect with people on a deeper heart level? Uh, I think it definitely, yes, the short answer is yes. I, I think that it definitely, um, helped me approach fiction from, a character perspective and being character driven instead of, um, you know, coming up with the plot first, for example. Um, so I'm a, I'm a character driven writer and even with, uh, with how fires end, for example, I didn't have, I didn't, I'm a, I'm a pantser. I didn't have everything worked out from the very beginning. Um, you know, the first scene that I wrote is now in the middle of the book. Um, and it's that scene where, um, the twins um, die playing with an unexploded shell. And I just explored from there following the characters. And I, and I definitely think that playing tabletop role-playing games, being a character in those games, helped me um, understand the importance of coming into a story at that level. Gotcha. Um, when did the uh, are, are you still working uh, on, on RPGs uh, by any chance? I am. I am. Um, I worked with an Italian game designer, uh, Francesco Nepotello. He's one of my all time favorite game designers um, on a new game that he's putting out. I'm not sure when it's coming out, but it's called Lex Arcana and it is um, the English translation of it should be out. If not this year, then early next. I've, I've worked on some of that with him. That's great. Um, when you, when you're designing an RPG, um, what are uh, what are some of the differences in writing uh, for a situation like that and and writing a novel? Um, it's a good question. Writing for role playing games is part. I like to think of it as part creative writing and part technical writing. Um, because you're not only dealing with a narrative that players will um, play through, 
but you also have to help them understand how to apply the rules of the game to that narrative. And that's where the, the technical writing comes in. Um, but the creative writing has to be really loose because you don't want to, you want to, you want to let it breathe and let the players take it in unexpected directions. So it, it can be challenging. And, and I always have to, uh, remind myself, I'm not writing fiction. This can't be, you know, you can't railroad the players as a, that's like a term in the, um, RPG world, right? Where, where they feel like they have no agency and they can't affect the world around them. So you really have to just give bits and pieces of a narrative and let them, let their imaginations take it wherever they will. Uh, and in, you know, in fiction, obviously you can't do that. Well, the new book, How Fires End, um, how did this transition, uh, begin for you with, you know, you're working in, uh, you, you also are a musician, which we haven't really talked about. You, you talked about your, 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 uh, wanting to pursue music, uh, and, and the reasons why, but, um, what, uh, what sort of music do you, do you play and, and how, what's that part of your life? Um, I play the guitar and I play the mandolin. Um, I'm self-taught in, in that regard. I, consider myself a failed musician. Uh, I spent most of the nineties in various bands trying to, um, take it to that next level and become from a local to a national. Right. And, and, and I, you know, there were like two moments where that almost seemed like it was possible and there could be like a, a, a record deal with a, a label on the horizon, but, but things never, uh, worked out. So, um, I'm sorry, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> that That's okay. Um, so are you, are you still playing music? Uh, personally I am not, not professionally, not in front of anyone, um, in my home. Yes. Gotcha. So you go through, um, to this period where you're pursuing music. You're also writing, uh, tabletop RPGs. Th those are both very specific, uh, career paths. How does this novel then kind of invade your mind and and creative space? So the the writing for tabletop RPGs actually happened toward the end, almost when I was on the on the other end of finishing How Fires End, um, and I started the novel after I had given up on music as uh, a career path. My father and I had gone to Sicily together, and um, that um, that trip that we took really opened up all the stories that I had heard over the years um, that he had told me. And I don't think that I ever would have written the book if I hadn't have gone to Sicily with him and seen uh you know the caves were his family hid in when the war blew through their village and the uh the statue of saint sebastian that he that he told me about and the um the almonds that he tended with his father so all of those all of a sudden these stories that he told me came alive and and i'd realized that that these seeds that he had planted it actually created nascent characters that were just banging around in my head that I hadn't been paying attention to my whole life. And that I, that was when I started listening. And, um, when we came back from that trip, um, I went to the Wesleyan summer writers conference, I think it's called, which is in Middletown where my parents live and where I grew up. Um, and, and that sort of set me on my path to, uh, writing the novel. And like I said, the RPG stuff happened sort of uh, a little later as um, as a way to make money writing. <laughs> <laughs> I think we've all been there at some point. Um, right. and, and it was enjoyable. Um, right, right. Yeah. So you go on this trip with your dad, and you've heard these stories your whole life, but seeing them, walking in the places, getting getting a, you know the smells in your nose and – and all of that, the the visceral aspects of it, that that's when the story began to come alive. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and and, and it's, it was when I realized that it had always been there and I just wasn't paying attention to it. Um, That's a really and, great point. And being alone with him for several weeks in Sicily and watching him react with a place that he has this deep connection to. I mean, it's his home and that he hadn't been back to in God knows how long. Um, really, really, you know, I sat up and I started to put my, who my father was, the hard man, the, the difficult relationship I had with him uh, into the context of where he came from and, and, and the trauma that he experienced. You know, you don't, you're not a, you can't be a young boy in a war and have your hometown being bombed and soldiers killing each other in the streets and not have that affect you in some way. The trauma of that he lived with, you know, he has lived with for his whole life. And, and I put that, I, I saw, so I saw him in a different way and um, in a way that allowed me to, to um, have empathy for these characters uh, in the novel that I, that I began working on. It's a, it, it's a crazy thing when you start, um, uh, this, this is going to sound weird when I say it, but start humanizing your parents. Um, and uh, it's it, very it, weird. Yes. It, yeah. I, I lost both of my parents this past year and, um, Oh, I'm sorry. Go, uh, well, well, thanks. Uh, but going through, you know, when my sister and I start going through all of her parents' stuff, and you start uncovering things and digging through things, and there's, you see your parents in a in a more human light, and all of a sudden, um, some of the past hurts and the grudges and things like that start to melt away into their humanity, and you start seeing. Um, you know, maybe there was a reason for this or that it doesn't, you know, completely excuse, you know, things, but, uh, it, it's, it, it, our parents are the only people in the world that we don't allow to have their humanity, um, you know, in some ways. And, uh, it, it's a powerful thing when you start seeing them as characters in the world, just like we see ourselves. Exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so you you realize that these characters were in your head, and you started getting a feel for this this place that your father loved so much, and and it uh, it obviously moved you pretty deeply. Um, how did the story start coming out? Where did the narrative thread start coming for for the the trip that you take us on in this book? So, I think as I mentioned earlier, the very first scene that I wrote um, is that moment where these two young children find an unexploded shell and uh, they start playing with it because they're, they don't know what it is. And it's 1943 Sicily and their brother witnesses it explode and kill them. Um, and for the longest time, I thought this is where the book begins. This is my character, Salvatore, the, the brother who survives, who witnesses this horrific um, accident. But as I kept writing forward from that moment. I, I got to a point in the narrative where I realized that there was more story that Salvatore either didn't know or would not tell. Um, and that's where David came into being. And I started writing his section. And I still had Salvatore first and David second. I was still thinking I was writing linearly. Um, but then I got to a point where I got to the limits of David's knowledge of the story. So it, it started to become very complicated uh, once I realized I had this stereoscopic narrative on my hands with multiple uh, narrators. Um, and, and I write out, and I also realized I'm writing out of order. Uh, David has to come first because then you experience um, Sal. Well, Sal's narrative can only happen because of what happens in, in uh, David's, for example. So it took a long time to understand and figure out that structure as I was moving pieces around. It's a, it's a really interesting setting and an interesting time uh, that we explore in the book. And um, there, there's a lot of renewed interest in 
the World War II time period in, in a lot of literature the last couple of years. Um, uh, I, there's a lot of historical fiction um, dealing with the period of the war. And, uh, you know, I, I think uh, a lot of the interest is because we're losing a lot of the people from that generation. And we're going to we're going to lose the stories that happen around these big you know, global set piece events. Um, but we're, we're losing the humanity uh, of that. But uh, this book deals with that time period and the fallout afterward. Um, what was the as you're starting to kind of pick these major events that are going to surround the book and surround the story. Um, how did you pick what things you, you would talk about? Um, I think that came organically from the characters, but really I was interested in how poor and working class, regular everyday people are swept up in these larger than life events. Um, and you know, the stories that I, about world war two that I grew up, with were always about the aftermath, about um, the Allied invasion of Sicily onward. And, uh, and I saw those effects. Um, I don't know that I knew when I was younger that my father suffered trauma. Um, you know, soldiers come back from war with PTSD, civilians do too. And I don't think there was, I don't think back then there weren't resources and certainly a man like my father, who's very, you know, who buys into machismo and, and these, these very traditional ideas of masculinity is not going to ask for help. And he's certainly not going to go to a therapist though. He needs one and there's nothing wrong with going to one. Um, so that's what I was interested in exploring. And, and as a child of someone who experienced this trauma, I knew that I had inherited it. And we, we know today that, that trauma is inherited, that the children of, of parents who suffer a traumatic event, in, you know, it's somehow in their genes or in their DNA. Or, um, so I, I definitely wanted to explore. Those were the things I wanted to explore, not like the larger, um, you know, not like the Saving Private Ryan kind of narrative of World War II, but more of the... the um, more of the down to earth regular people what's it like for them afterward what how do they go on and i really looked to the um italian neorealist cinema that came out of italy uh after directly after the war um movies like rome open city the bicycle thief um the earth trembles those were all films that out of necessity because their economy was in shambles they just filmed they didn't build sets they just filmed you know in the streets in apartments and they used regular people instead of actors um and they were all concerned with the civilians and their and 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 how they put their lives back together after after these conflicts how they how they try to live uh when their economy is in shambles and they're trying to find work to feed their families and and the stress that that puts on them and that was what i was interested in exploring um, did you talk to your dad uh, at all about this idea for this book, and um, uh, did he have any input for you? I always – yes, I always uh, re referred back to him if I had a question. Um, I, I love listening to his stories. I'll call him and say, tell me about you know, the statue of St. Sebastian. You know, he'll go on very happily. Um, and so, yeah, if I ever if I ever had a question or if I thought my memory of something he told me um, was suspect, I would I would ask him to to talk about it. And he would he he happily does it and would ask me, why do you want to know about this stuff? You know, and I told him I was writing a book and I don't really think that it it uh, I don't think that it sunk in that now it has that he can have a copy in his hand and see it. Um, but I don't think at the time he really knew what, what that meant. Um, you've mentioned the, the statue of St. Sebastian a couple of times. The, uh, the statue plays, uh, a really an, an anchoring role, uh, in the book. Uh, what was your, um, your thought process about using, um, the statue to, to be such a kind of central set piece in the story? 
Uh, well, it's a it's a central um, part of the lives of not only the people in Malili, Sicily, but the people from Malili who immigrated to Middletown, Connecticut. Um, in Middletown, they built a church in the image of the one that they left behind in, in their village. They um, fashioned a statue in the, you know, in the image of the one that, that they have in Malili. And they, every year they hold the same feast in Middletown that they hold in Malili in honor of the saint. And the, the story of the stature of St. Sebastian and how it came to Malili is something that I always heard growing up, not just from my father, but from other people, everyone in Middletown who is a Sicilian with, um, who can trace their lineage back to Malili knows this story. Um, and when I was a kid, it, it seemed like such a magical thing. I mean, it's almost like the, the, um, the sword in the stone, right? Um, where no one, the, the statue washes ashore from a shipwreck and no one can pick it up except for the people from the Lily, which is very much like no one can pull the sword from the stone except for Arthur. And it just seemed like when I started to, when I, when I finally sat down to like, okay, I'm going to write this, this, I'm going to write this book about these characters that I knew that had to be in there. Um, there are uh, portions of the book that uh, that deal seriously with trauma and some very traumatic scenes in the book, um, but you really handle them with care. Uh, and there's uh, you know there's some some hard stuff that goes on, but at no point in the book did I feel like it was um, you know violence porn. Uh, can you talk a little bit about, about how you balance the uh, the really hard stuff that goes on while not allowing us, the readers, to just sink into despair over them? It was difficult. It was. It took a lot. I mean, it 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 took me ten years to write this book, um, and those were the most difficult pieces. And I I think I think that I approached it from a character perspective and also from a perspective of having empathy for what's happening and, and empathy, not just for the characters in the situation, but also for people reading it so that it's tasteful and not distasteful. Um, so that it's just what the narrative needs and not more than that. So that it doesn't drift into, um, as you said, uh, violence porn. Um, yeah, I, th I think that's. Um, while while not being uh, autobiographical, uh, the book it does seem that there are a lot of things that parallel um, your experience and and obviously your father's experience. Um, in in writing this book, did you discover things about yourself uh, along the journey? Um, I did. I discovered. Well, I, I think first of all, I just dis I discovered. Wow, my father is a human being, and he has feelings just like just like I do, and and all of that tension that we had dissipated immediately as soon as I I I, I took I saw him for who he was, uh, and I think that was the biggest journey that I went on as I was writing the book that um, I had empathy for him and and and, and for for all that he is a difficult man. Um, to live with and to deal with and for all of the things that he did that I disagree with um, over the course of our lives um, I understand them and I put them in context and, and even the things that I felt at the you know that I felt could be unforgivable I, I, um, I don't think that way anymore so that was the that was the surprising journey that I think I went on personally as I was writing the book well, the book is extremely powerful. Uh, it's uh, and, and and very entertaining. Um, I, I love this book so much. Uh, How Fires End is available everywhere now uh, in uh, an, an audiobook, uh, hardcover, Kindle edition, uh, however you like to uh, 
consume books that's available. Uh, there's uh, links to it in the show notes. Uh, Marco, if, if people are just learning about you and the work that you do, is there a place where they can find you online and connect with you? Yes, I have a website. Uh, it's marcorafala.com, and um, they can they can find all information about uh, me and the novel and um, where I might be in, in the country as I go on tour. Excellent. Uh, well, Marco, uh, it's been a lot of fun talking. Uh, good luck on the book, and uh, we wish you much success. Thank you very much. Now stay tuned for an audiobook excerpt from Richard Gleaves, the Jason Crane series. On the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, Joey locked the doors of the Washington Irving Chapel and checked the windows from the outside, making sure that the cemetery offices were dark. Satisfied, he donned a knit cap and trudged uphill to the employee parking lot. He'd forgotten how desolate the grounds became at night. A fog had gathered, blurring the moon and stars. His rusty Volkswagen Beetle, christened Ladybug by Jason, sat in shadow alongside his dad's white van, which bore an image of the horseman and the cemetery's web address. Joey swept a palmful of condensation from Ladybug's windshield and fumbled for his keys. He heard a laugh, high and young. He froze. Hello? He shook off goose flesh and found his key. He started the engine and backed out. Headlights off, praying not to knock over a headstone, again. A child stood on the hillside amongst the graves. You okay, kid? Cemetery's closed. He turned on his headlights. The child vanished. Joey idled in the drive, frowning. What had just happened? He turned off the headlights and waited for his eyes to adjust. The silhouette reappeared. The child stood in the road now, blocking his way. He and the ghost stared at each other. He bit his tongue and squinted over the steering wheel. He couldn't resolve the ghost's features, only a tiny body in... Ruffles? Yes, a dress. A little girl with shoulder-length hair. The figure crouched, threw its arms over its head and skipped away. A giggle followed after. The ghost skipped up the hill, turned around, and beckoned through the fog. Please come. Joey shook his head. No way. Ain't gonna happen. But he felt compelled to follow. What could a little girl do to him after all? He would keep a safe distance. The gravel sounded like soft rain beneath his tires. It drew him helplessly past weeping cypresses and mausoleums blue with moonlight. He followed the giggle, the skipping ribbons, the little body made of shadow and quicksilver. The north end of the cemetery grounds rose to a steep wooded slope. The ghost had led him to Section 77, the northernmost boundary of the cemetery, but he'd lost her. He killed the engine, summoned his courage, and climbed out. The night air brought him fully awake. Where are you? he whispered, scanning the graves. A row of diseased hemlock trees stood at the fence line. Joey knew them well. They were dying, infested by some parasite called, he fished for the name, Woolly Adelgig. His crew had cut them back many times, lopping off limbs and heads, trying to save them. The hemlocks had grown back twisted and tormented, they stood as a row of grotesque sentinels guarding the threshold of the forest. The ghost climbed the slope, spun at the fence, and sat hugging her knees. The black mass of the Rockefeller State Park Preserve loomed behind her. What do you want? Joey whispered. Play. He stepped forward, hands shaking. He just wanted to see her face, the face of a real ghost. To see the curve of her cheek, the sparkle that might have been her left eye. Come and play, Joey. He froze. The sound of his name terrified him. She pointed over his shoulder. Play with us. He turned and realized his mistake. He'd driven with his eyes on the girl, trying not to lose her, never looking behind. They had been followed. 